Anyway, yes, um, I uh, maybe just a, uh, just a, uh, some little intro. I'm a, uh, my name is Obrad Vučkovac, and I come from University of Belgrade, uh, Winter Institute of Nuclear Sciences, where I work as a head of library and also as a repository manager uh, of our institutional repository. Uh, and also very interesting in this uh, interested in this topic of research data management and everything related to it. So it's fairly a new thing here in Serbia, and uh, there are just unfortunately a uh, small number of usually librarians uh, who are uh, dealing with this uh, topic. So uh, because uh, we uh, yesterday and day before we had some uh, power outages here, uh, I prepared myself. Uh, so in case I, I uh, get out of internet connection electricity, I will uh, get uh, from my phone. So uh, I share my uh, presentations with my uh, with other trainers here, so they, they are aware of this. Uh, so that can be a first lesson <laughs> right now uh, uh, to always be prepared for, for uh, some uh, cases where, when something, something inevitable can happen uh, for like power shortages, uh, loss of internet connection, uh, I don't know, even in the case of a uh, zombie apocalypse, you just forget about trainings, <laughs> run to the hills. So, okay, uh, today we will discuss, uh, the first lecture will be on research data management. Um, this is a huge topic now, uh, and, uh, it's, and it's a very complex one. And uh, there are numerous training challenges uh, we have today with this topic. The co topic itself is very complex. Uh, you don't deal just uh, with uh, RDM. With, uh, you, there is also a thing uh, that is related and part of the RDM is data management planning, DMPs. Then you have fair data principles as a way of uh, 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 better doing uh, uh, data management. And also uh, think about the data publishing and uh, licenses is a very broad topic. Uh, and of course, uh, the reason why are we here and doing this is open science and open data. Uh, challenge can also be with terminology. There are a lot of uh, uh, terminologies that are maybe researchers are not usually aware of that um, can be uh, from metadata to to, uh, uh, to different standards, communication protocols. That is something that they are not very related to. And um, also, one of the biggest misconception is when you talk when you uh, combine RDM and open science. They usually think of open data, and uh, and that that point researchers can be very uh, wary. And uh, because uh, they usually uh, momentarily then think, oh, I don't want to share my data with anybody. I don't want to be openly uh, available to, to anybody, to anyone. Uh, so that is one of the biggest misconceptions and you, can, you should be, uh, talk about it very early on. Uh, also, RDM is an a example of good research practice, but unfortunately, it is not always mandatory in, a, in a, a, a lots of uh, na national uh, and institutional environments. Uh, so that is something that we should, uh, that is a, a, a quite a big challenge. Uh, because when something is not mandatory, it can be uh, like uh, uh, the researchers can perceive this as another thing that uh, they need to do and uh, what they usually said it is administrative administrative burden uh, for them especially when it comes to dmps uh, also infrastructure can be a challenge if uh, you lack one uh, uh, it can be challenging to persuade uh, researchers to to use something that is not part of their uh, institutional or national uh, 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 infrastructure or surrounding so, and also infrastructure is better to be uh, in a national language, something that is 
uh, usually missing. Usually it's only in, in English. And uh, of course, there are uh, no incentives, usually no incentives for researchers uh, to uh, deal with this kind of extra work. So I usually start my, uh, my uh, lectures with a definition of research data management, but I instantly emphasize this as a good research practice. And also, uh, I think you should emphasize more on uh, final goals of RDM. And that is something that every researchers, a researcher uh, will uh, uh, get familiar uh, with. It's uh, for their data to be secured and preserved. That is very important. And also uh, to be easy to, uh, to, to be findable, to be understandable and uh, to be re reusable. And uh, you can, uh, if they're not uh, very uh, wary, if, if they don't want to share the data to uh, open it, uh, you can uh, tell them that uh, they uh, can use this uh, as a way for themselves. Who knows, maybe in 10 years, uh, five, 10 years, they will like to repeat some experiment and that, that and uh, maybe they will have difficulties to understand that data they themselves collected uh, maybe a couple of few years ago. Um, uh, so uh, also it is very important uh, to define what is research data. It uh, depends on the research field, depends on the you know, researchers. And, uh, it, and uh, what is also important is uh, to uh, explain them that uh, there, there is uh, no just digital data, there is also non-digital data, especially this is for the fields of uh, social sciences, humanities, they often deal with uh, non-digital data that, that can also be managed. You know, uh, you, you can manage physical samples, you can uh, digitize that physical uh, object, objects like 3D digitization, uh, but also these physical objects can include metadata, which is also part of this data management process. Uh, and you just ask them a question, what needs for your data to be understandable, reusable, even after some longer period of time? So uh, that is not just data, it also includes metadata to uh, uh, describe better the, this data and also other documentations like uh, software code, code books, uh, 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 machine or, or instrument calibrations and, and so on. And that should be in uh, sustainable formats for future use. Um, also, keep in mind uh, to, uh, to, uh, to explain them that data and metadata uh, needs to be in uh, uh, machine readable and, uh, formats. Uh, so uh, uh, both machines and humans can use it uh, in the future. Um, Okay, um, yes. Uh, and, and yeah, and, and this is something that we will explain more in uh, when we'll do uh, next uh, lecture with you, uh, Fair Principles. Uh, uh, why is RDM needed today? Uh, there are a lot of reasons, uh, uh, like uh, funder requirements, which is very actual today. Uh, you ha we have it now in uh, Horizon 2020 and now in Horizon Europe in Europe, uh, and also uh, private funders like Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Wellcome Trust, uh, national funders also uh, insist on uh, RDM. You, you, you have also institutional policies that uh, uh, want this to happen. Also publishers more and more ask researchers to deposit their data uh, for uh, review. Um, uh, also, it is good for uh, as a way to increase citations, to improve communication, and also leads to a better cooperation. All these reasons you can uh, explain your and discuss to your to your researchers. Uh, it leads to better transparency, uh, to better reproducibility for later on. And uh, one of the huge reasons, big reasons, especially uh, important for institutions, is uh, to prevent data loss and to prevent it to, to archive it for uh, long-term preservation. Um, 
and also to reduce duplication of efforts. Some experiments can be very costly. Uh, other experiments can uh, include ethical uh, uh, matters, uh, like experiments on, on animals or uh, research on human subjects. Uh, you don't want to, re uh, to repeat that uh, if it is not necessary. So it's better to have good and well-organized uh, alien. Uh, um, common misconceptions can be, like I said, administrative burden, uh, fear of data scooping or, and uh, lack of control over data. And uh, like I said, you have to explain that it's not IBM doesn't mean necessarily mean open data. Uh, fear of wrong interpretation, that is also one of the biggest misconceptions uh, that can be uh, quite uh, uh, challenging uh, because uh, researchers fear of that. But uh, if uh, uh, data was managed uh, accordingly uh, and uh, with good practice uh, from the beginning to the end of uh, research, then that should not be a, a problem. Also, there are uh, other concerns uh, like uh, intellectual property uh, issues, uh, data privacy that is uh, uh, understandable and uh, that can be arranged, uh, like I said, with a good, uh, good RDM. Uh, there are some tips, uh, and I will mention that uh, at the end uh, is to, uh, be prepared for uh, when you have uh, your uh, lectures, be pre prepared for this, uh, because uh, maybe uh, some, especially uh, like senior researchers will uh, immediately uh, impose this as an as a, as a issue. Uh, be prepared for this kind of uh, questions uh, and uh, uh, be prepare uh, your answers. Uh, it's uh, okay to, uh, to it's uh, uh, good to have a data champion with you. Like data champion is as a term for some re uh, researchers that ha uh, that have experiences uh, with this with uh, RDM and. Uh, also, it's good to have uh, some uh, material with you that you can uh, uh, relate on. You can uh, send links uh, to uh, some designated websites for your uh, for researchers to uh, investigate, explore more on this uh, topic. Um, you can also design your own website. I think on the day five we will have uh, some uh, uh, lectures on how to do that and also promote RDM whenever you can on workshops, website, social media, it's all uh, good. Uh, yeah, uh, what is really important from the start uh, is to explain researchers that uh, data management is something that happens throughout the re research, life uh, research life cycle. Uh, so, it begins in a, uh, before research when it, it is still in planning phase and uh, continues during the active research. The, uh, there are things that can be done. Also after research, when things can uh, have to be prepared for long-term archiving, uh, long-term preservation and sharing. And, uh, and uh, after that, we go to uh, reusing data again and to start this uh, circle uh, all over again uh, for some future research. Uh, so uh, just a quick overview of these uh, uh, phases. Uh, first, in, in this planning phase, what can be a final product of this is data management plan. We'll have it today covered by uh, my colleague Irena. Uh, I will just give some basic overview of this. Um, uh, uh, it is uh, just a way to, to better design your research to, to see if it's compliant to policies, to identify uh, resources that, uh, that are needed, how to collect data and everything. It is very, very important phase. And don't forget to insist that uh, with your researchers uh, to, to carefully manage the RDM process. Uh, during the active phase, when uh, researchers collect 
their data or generate uh, their data, it is important to uh, explain them how to, the, the best ways, uh, how to organize uh, data, uh, how to uh, name their files and folders, uh, uh, what terminology they should use, uh, do, do, should you, they use acronyms or, or some uh, words uh, or names that are common in their research field, how to separate words because uh, what I said, machine, uh, machine action reality is very important and uh, formats, to agree on formats, especially when it comes to dates. Uh, also uh, organization of folders, files in folders, they have some kind of hierarchical structure. And then that should be all, like I said, uh, uh, discussed in a planning phase. Also, what, what is interesting uh, it, here is version control. Uh, guide them to, to use version controls whenever it is possible. Uh, uh, if there is no uh, in infrastructure, uh, this uh, thing with versions, they can use, um, they can use, uh, uh, or just uh, to, to name it on, on files, uh, like v1, v2.1, and so on. And final version should be final and just that, nothing final, 0 0.1, 5, 0 0.2, and so on. Um, important thing of this phase is metadata. It is a huge thing. It's very important, uh, and it uh, it is good to have it uh, separately if it's po possible to have separate uh, um, lectures on this. Uh, but in a nutshell, uh, metadata should be standardized, structured, and uh, available for both human and machines to, to be uh, accessed and read. Um, uh, there are some resources, uh, but I will leave uh, uh, links more in uh, Open Plato. You can find it later. Um, uh, but I will just emphasize this this one, this metadata MOOC. Uh, it was, I think, on, on Coursera. Uh, it is very interesting. Now this, this link is on YouTube. I uh, encourage you to, to uh, look at it and uh, maybe you, you will get some more insights and, uh, and uh, for your lectures. Also, you have standards. Fair sharing is a good uh, point uh, for standards and, uh, and also RDA. And also there are tools I will leave it, uh, like I said, uh, more in open Plato. Uh, except for metadata, insist on uh, keeping documentations uh, like uh, notebooks, especially lab no electronic lab notebooks, readme files are, are very uh, important. And I left here a uh, link to uh, a guide uh, that you can be uh, useful uh, when explaining and uh, uh, readme files. Uh, also, uh, yes, and documentation is practically anything that can uh, provide additional information for data and it should go together with uh, the, the data sets when archiving and depositing data. Um, uh, during the processing and analyzing phase, this is uh, something that uh, it is more uh, oriented to researchers, but there are uh, some uh, things that you can consider and uh, exp and describe it, uh, explain you to your researchers like anonymization of sensitive data. They can use some free tools like Amnesia by OpenAir, uh, but also uh, 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 things like um, uh, that are ready for data cleaning and uh, quality checking validation. Uh, OpenRefine is a nice tool uh, and you can uh, have a like separate uh, uh, separate workshops on this topic. It can be a uh, very useful tool. But, and also in this uh, phase, uh, it is also uh, important, uh, like in previous phase, to document your data, to describe it, uh, and to uh, be careful about uh, how you store it, uh, how it's organized, and uh, of course, uh, to have version control. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, keeping data safe, 
I always uh, point to this uh, picture uh, or, it, or, or <laughs> any catastrophic picture of, of uh, burned computers. And, and there, there was even uh, some fortunate event, I think maybe five, five years ago, when uh, a whole deposit with physical data, uh, the, the researchers were depositing physical data just uh, for this case, in case somebody um, steal their, their digital data to have a physical uh, samples. And that uh, wing of that uh, building uh, was uh, burned. Uh, so they lost that data too. So nothing is safe. And uh, you should they, uh, you should explain that to them and uh, they need to be aware of this. And uh, data needs to be safe uh, during the active phase and after the, re the research. Uh, during the active phase, uh, you should uh, tell them about backup plan. And that is something that uh, must be uh, discussed during the planning phase as well. Uh, there are some rules. One of the most common rules is three to one rule. For backup, um, uh, three uh, copies of data, two uh, on different media, and one uh, of this copy should be outside of uh, your institution uh, or their workplace. And uh, it, uh, it is advisable to have that uh, store on some cloud storage or, or some other data server that, uh, that is very well protected. And what is uh, also uh, they should keep in mind that backup and long-term preservation are not the same. So that should be keep in mind. Backup is just uh, during the active phase of of, uh, uh, of research. Also, uh, they uh, explain them access control. Uh, some sensitive data uh, should be password protected. As, uh, sometimes uh, by legal. Uh, things it needs to be uh, protected with passwords, with encryptions and all kinds of mechanisms that uh, they uh, should be used. Um, during the, uh, after the research is done, uh, presentation can be there, uh, done with long-term preservation. Uh, not all data uh, can be selected for pre preservation because uh, maybe it could be a, uh, huge load of data. Um, and uh, yes, and uh, um, yeah, yeah, so data should be selected for what needs to be uh, ready for long term. Uh, here you have um, one uh, th <clears throat> thing to have in mind or, or with this is that uh, data that is not repeatable, like astronomical data, <clears throat> data that came from expensive experiments on experiments on the animals should be kept uh, for, for longer terms. And also it depends on your institution, your capacities, and also for the kind of data, how long should be, it be, uh, be preserved. Uh, sometimes it is for life, other times for five, 10 years, depends. Um, also, migrate data uh, to open and sustainable formats. Uh, I have a here link of uh, some preferred formats that you can use. Um, and also uh, archive uh, uh, both data and documentation and metadata uh, as well. Uh, during the sharing phase, uh, and I will discuss it uh, in the, the last uh, lecture today, uh, more in detail, uh, but some things to keep in mind here, to just uh, choose discipline, uh, uh, choose, sorry, repositories where should you should share your data. Um, it's better to choose a repository than uh, to deposit data as uh, supplementary in journal articles. Um, also have uh, in mind to, to have a trustworthy uh, data repositories, uh, certified, okay, but even if uh, like Zenodo is not certified, but it is uh, has solid user uh, community base and uh, has uh, a policy on lot for long standing. Also, like I said, when sharing, 
it is good to provide uh, both metadata and documentation. So it, the, the imperative is uh, for data to be understandable. And also for sharing, it is important to have uh, the date for data to have a license, um, to have uh, all the access controlled in place and, uh, and uh, described. Um, and also for licenses, usually funders or institution, uh, you should look for, for their uh, policies and requirements on the, on this subject. And uh, to, you can uh, uh, acknowledge your uh, uh, researchers how to uh, look for it and what license uh, to take. And also one of the good examples lately is to share your data uh, to uh, through a data paper. So at the end, uh, training tips, like I said, avoid, uh, avoid teaching everything about IDM in one event. This is, this is not something uh, I usually uh, uh, advise to, to break it down in smaller pieces, if you can uh, separately explain RDM, DMPs, fair data, data publishing, uh, and even if you can uh, uh, divide it in more smaller chunks, like uh, like uh, for metadata, for repositories, uh, it's better than to have it all in one because the whole topic is overwhelming and uh, maybe it could be all in some, I don't know, three hours. It can be very long and uh, it can uh, go to, uh, to the, some kind of information overload for, for researchers. Um, have in mind final goals, always explain that the, uh, the data needs to be secure, preserved, easy to find, understandable, reusable. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, and also um, uh, deal with all the misconceptions as soon as possible, possibly in, at the start of your presentations, uh, because uh, uh, there will be some kind of questions. Maybe uh, researchers wouldn't listen you to very much as they they might. Uh, data champions is always good to have with you. Like I said, researchers that had previous knowledge uh, and experience with data management. Uh, we had some uh, in our uh, presentations. It is very very helpful to a uh, helpful uh, thing to have. Uh, Ex, uh, like I say, explain terminology. Uh, it is good to have uh, some kind of glossary that they you can uh, uh, provide them uh, to to look upon. Uh, use cases are always good to have with you to present them some uh, good use, use cases, um, and recommend uh, materials. Uh, if you, uh, provide some leaflets, like I said, websites. Uh, blogs, anything that can uh, you relate them to to further exploration of this topic, and of course stay informed about the new developments, about uh, new policy, uh, your policies, new policies and requirements that are uh, needed for this uh, topic. So that's it for for this lecture. So if you have any questions now. I'll stop sharing here or yes I, I sorry I couldn't uh, look for the chat at the moment but uh, yeah if, if you need to discuss this uh, uh, topic uh, furthermore uh, you can also leave uh, leave it to uh, chat uh, so uh, maybe we can discuss it uh, later on okay so because I think we I probably um, yeah, I probably uh, don't have much time. So I'll move just on uh, on the next um, uh, presentation. It is about um, just a second about fair principles. Uh, this one will be a shorter one. I will have to be very swift with this. And uh, uh, at, at the end, we will have of this lecture. We will have um, uh, we will have a, a, a exercise where you will, uh, like I said yesterday, you will get 
some uh, metadata records and uh, we'll try to assess it uh, to fair principles. So without further ado, I will, I will just share my screen. Okay, I hope you can see it. So uh, fair principles, um, it's a very uh, interesting topic. It's a very up-to-date topic. Um, and uh, there are a lot of challenges uh, when uh, dealing with th this thing. Um, it is, all, like I said, it's a very complex topic as well. Uh, there are a lot of things to be considered. Uh, terminology is one of the factors. Uh, there are some kind of uh, some uh, um, uh, words and term uh, terminology that uh, it's more related to IT uh, or in, uh, or information science uh, jargons. Uh, then there's something that most re researchers uh, are dealing with uh, on the every day. Uh, like metadata standards, communication protocols, uh, control vocabularies, uh, ontologies, that it can be uh, 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 tricky for them. Um, and uh, and uh, yes, and um, also there are misconceptions, like I said, uh, dealing with uh, data and open science, like, uh, like we had previous. Usually people think that uh, if they, something should be ready for machine readability, it op needs to be open. So uh, keep that in mind, it can be uh, very uh, uh, in tricky. Um, yes, uh, also the, uh, the problem is it uh, there is also a steep lear learning curve of uh, FAIR. Uh, principles, um, uh, you need to consume a lot of new information for most, and uh, and uh, it need, takes a lot of time, lots of effort to learn, but once you get to that plateau, you will understand better, more topics, and you can provide assistance and help to your researchers. Um, like with RDM, if it's not mandatory, it can be it can be difficult to persuade researchers uh, to adhere to these principles. But I always keep in mind to tell them that it's for their own good, and uh, maybe if they want, don't want to open data now, the, uh, fair data uh, can be uh, uh, helpful for them. And maybe if they decide to open late, uh, data later, it can be uh, good to have good data. And of course, there are usually lack of incentives for this extra work. Um, I usually uh, start these uh, trainings with, by explaining what is uh, the uh, fair principles, that uh, this is not principles, it is not standard. And uh, I usually uh, provide them this link with this uh, uh, article that was a corner store article that uh, was published in scientific data and that explains these uh, guiding principles. Um, lots of uh, uh, funders now require uh, data to be fair and that is something that is good to, to as a, in fact, uh, as the way to persuade uh, researchers to uh, oblige to these uh, principles. Um, uh, why are fair principles needed? Um, like I said, uh, it is uh, very important to uh, explain that, that data is not just intended for uh, humans, it, it, more and more uh, research is done by comput uh, computational work. Uh, and uh, data needs to be in that uh, particular format to be machine, actionable machine readable. Uh, how does it fair relates with RDM and open data? How it relates with these concepts? You can show this uh, then this uh, visualization with, with this graph. Uh, if we have like overall research data that is uh, unstructured, unmanaged, that is like, uh, it's called the wild. And uh, 
you have this RDM thing, uh, you manage your data that is one uh, subset of this whole uh, research data that you have that is now managed, it is good. And FAIR data is even on some more uh, level than that. It is now ready to be machine actionable and, uh, and better used. And when it comes to open data, open data can be also unmanaged. You can, uh, you can open your data even if you didn't do any good, good uh, practices of research data management and, uh, and FAIR. It is not advisable, advise your researchers. If they want to open data, uh, they should uh, actually uh, go to, to on this break uh, section here. They should have that data open and fair as well. And another visualization can be like this, like some kind of uh, pyramid. You have the, your uh, self-interest, like you have to manage your data but to have a uh, community benefit, your, your data should be fair and uh, on that fair, like upgrade should be open on that uh, particular term. Um, so uh, training, uh, uh, um, how to explain uh, uh, fair principles. One of the, uh, I usually explain it with uh, going through the principles itself, it can be very uh, uh, boring <laughs> because it's usually just technical stuff uh, and uh, reading. I just, uh, you, sh you should just uh, point out to maybe some key elements for findable principle. It's like uh, PADs and uh, rich metadata. It's very, and also, I, you should point out here that uh, uh, fair principles not just relate to data, but also to metadata. Like uh, you can see, it's uh, um, for data metadata, but also uh, uh, indirectly uh, to also to research uh, to infrastructure as well, like this F4 principle. Um, for accessibility uh, principle, uh, it is also to keep in mind good repository deals a lot uh, to have uh, open protocols and uh, and free to use and that where you should uh, they could put their metadata. Uh, interoperable, uh, interoperable principle is very uh, can be com complicated because it uh, needs a lot of. IT jargonism, uh, there is included a lot of information science uh, terminology like uh, vocabularies and control uh, control vocabularies and knowledges. And uh, maybe you should explain that in more details uh, to them. Uh, reusability uh, focus on licenses, uh, on uh, extra documentation that uh, can, uh, that is needed to explain uh, their uh, data sets, uh, like readme files is one of good examples. Uh, uh, I usually uh, have this kind of uh, better uh, way of uh, trainings uh, with fair assessment, uh, ask researchers to bring their data uh, for assessment uh, or prepare uh, uh, some of your own. And uh, you can do it one-on-one -on -one or on some training uh, on, or with, uh, with a larger group or smaller group, maybe better. And uh, you can uh, check their, assess their uh, data set uh, on uh, how fair is, it is. And you have some assessment tools uh, like Fuji uh, by Fair is Fair is a very good one. Uh, you can just insert the link uh, the UR URL and uh, of the data set and uh, the Fuji will automatically explain what needs to be done to be uh, better fair. You have also some uh, uh, self-assessment uh, assessment tools like this one of dance and uh, of Australian research, uh, research data common. And uh, yeah, and you also have uh, some um, this uh, RDAF uh, uh, fair data maturity model, which is very uh, good uh, to have. Um, 
Yeah, fair data. Fair is not just for uh, data. It can it now uh, more and more it is used for uh, other uh, uh, research uh, things like uh, research software, and uh, also for training materials. And uh, now we have uh, one uh, uh, interest group in uh, in RDA uh, for research hardware. That was that will be very interesting to 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 see. And uh, there are some upgrades on FAIR, like uh, uh, trust principles that are dealing with uh, how to manage your uh, repository to be more trustworthy. Uh, because uh, uh, if, to have data that is FAIR, one of the key element, key factors is to have a good repository to uh, deposit the data to. Um, other, another example are care principles uh, that are uh, in, uh, meant to uh, for uh, the, uh, for doing research with indigenous people and uh, it, uh, for doing research in more ethical way. I will just uh, leave you uh, uh, links here for more uh, research. So training tips, just basically, uh, this is very important subject. Always keep in mind to to to. You, you to have a training on this, uh, at least to inform uh, uh, your researchers that uh, they should be aware of their principles. Like I said, exploring terminology, use the examples for it, use uh, real life use cases, um, have uh, data for uh, demonstration, demonstrations and exercises and um, and uh, uh, learning by doing is probably one of the best ways uh, for uh, on how to deal uh, with this complex subject. And yeah, that's it. If you have any quick questions, because I think I uh, um, I um, we don't have much time now, and so. Um, I think we should go now in breakout rooms. I know Irina, if you could help me with this. Yeah, I'm still setting them up. Uh -huh. but maybe you can ex explain us a bit, because uh, you, you shared uh, images. How, how are we supposed to? Uh, I've, shared yeah. links, uh, I've shared links in our shared document, so you can find links there. Uh, can we have just four breakout rooms for two reasons? Liliana has issues with connectivity, mm -hmm. and the other problem is that one of the examples doesn't work because the repository is down. <laughs> so it's a good oh. example how not to choose a repository <laughs> because it's not available. It's not working today. <laughs> Okay, okay. It's a data center example. So we have four examples. If, if we can have only four breakout rooms and in our shared documents, there are links. I can share them uh, here in the chat if you wish. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, please. And uh, yes, you, you, you have, like you said, uh, that this is, uh, uh, yeah, I know this, this one example. We had issues uh, with that example a few days ago, but I thought that they uh, managed to, to do it. But unfortunately okay uh can the trainers access the document and see the links or i shall uh, shall i share the links now for all no, the rooms here now i see so maybe let's let's stop um, recording because i'm sorry it's... Mil, it's what are what are they why are they important uh, what are the main elements uh, of uh, dmp and i will show you some dmp tools and uh, share some some useful uh, links so first of all, what is a DMP? It is a document specifying how research data will be handle, handled both during and after a research project. Uh, it identifies strategies which ensure that research data are of high quality, that they are secure, sustainable, accessible, reusable, basically that they are fair among other things. DMP should cover all the, the phases of the data life cycle over that talked about. And um, the length of uh, DMP itself varies. Uh, NSF, for example, has a limit of two pages for DMP and Horizon Europe's DMPs can be pretty long. 
uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, DMP is a living document. What does it mean? Uh, it means that uh, it evolves over time. So it not only can, but should be updated during the project itself. You can make several versions, versions of it. The last one being the one at the end of the project. DMP is done when the project is done. Uh, it is usually arranged uh, sections reflecting funders' requirements. So uh, DMPs are mandatory, and they're not only mandatory on the account of funders, but also by the increasing number of national institutional policies, and also many universities strongly advise their doctoral students to, to create a DMP for, uh, for their uh, the doctoral thesis. So why do researchers need DMPs? Uh, first of all, it is for the sake of their own research. It keeps the data safe because data can be lost. It can be inaccessible. Creating data can be expensive, not only in a uh, monetary sense, but it takes time and human resources, resources to, uh, to collect uh, data. And uh, sometimes, uh, or better to say, often it is completely impossible to recreate the data. Apart from that, uh, uh, sometimes on the course of time, it is hard for researchers themselves to find their way around a great number of folders, names of files, and DMPs help them organize the data and uh, easily navigate through, through their own files. Um, DMP avoid, uh, DMPs avoid uh, wrongful accusation. Uh, so I wrote here, uh, as an example, to give you the, the, the climate gate, uh, what is it all about? So uh, in 2008, uh, emails remo were removed uh, without authorization from a University of East Anglia server, and uh, they were posted to the internet. This scandal alleging fraud by leading climate scientists became known as, uh, as climate gate. Uh, multiple investigations concluded that no fraud or scientific misconduct has occurred, but nevertheless, the email controversy has had its impacts, both positive and negative. It made some people certain that climate change is not really happening, but uh, on the positive side, it served as a proof that uh, transparency, data availability, and strong quality insurance, insurance procedures are important. And... Um, uh, this scandal motivated many organizations to review their data management practices. Um, data management plan encourages the reuse. Uh, it encourages the reuse of data, which funders pay for, and they uh, want to see that uh, you are prepared to share the data. Um, so, uh, yes, also scientific journals also uh, often require uh, that the research data are made openly available available to others. And uh, the last reason for a researcher to write a DMP is uh, because it, uh, it because the funder requires it. But uh, in reality, it is unfortunately the main reason research and the only probably uh, reason researchers create it. Uh, it has uh, become mandatory for researchers to write a DMP in, in order to get funding for, for the, their research. So uh, that is why we, we have gotten, as librarians, we have gotten familiar with the uh, DMPs, with their fun function and structure, and the way that uh, DMPs influence the, the research themselves. Uh, so uh, before writing a DMP, uh, it is always a good idea to, to check out the DMPs that uh, have already been approved. Uh, so, and you can find uh, these, um, these uh, DMPs in different repositories like Zenodo, uh, Figshare, there are public uh, DMPs in Argos, we'll talk about it later. Um, <clears throat> so, um, as I already said, uh, DMPs should cover all phases of the research data lifecycle. And um, usually the funder provides the researchers with the templates which help them prepare DMP. And uh, these templates uh, consist of uh, different sections. And uh, these are the most common parts of the DMP. You usually have to describe uh, uh, what types of uh, data, amounts of data, or file formats you'll produce in, in the course of project. Um, you have to describe data standards and metadata, 
uh, data storage and access, intellectual property, uh, reuse, publishing data and preservation and uh, uh, response, uh, responsibilities. So, um, um, so, what, uh, so these are the, the most common parts of the DMP. Uh, and um, some, this, the first part uh, can be really tricky because uh, sometimes the file formats uh, researchers collect are not the same they'll be using for, for sharing their data, uh, which is something that ha they have to, to pay attention to. As for the other stages, there are many elements of PMD that are uh, discipline specific. So uh, maybe uh, you will not be able to give advice on it. Uh, there are also legal issues and sometimes uh, we cannot give uh, suitable advice on it too. So that is why the, the, um, the process of creating the DMP should really involve a number of experts, not just one data steward, uh, because he cannot, he cannot cover all, all the topics that emerge. Uh, here you have some uh, useful tools like wizards, uh, checklists, and templates. You have a number of links in this presentation, so uh, just keep in mind that some institutions are subscribed to some of these tools. So naturally, you will use a wizard or, or a tool you're subscribed to. Um, important thing is uh, that uh, these tools are machine readable. And if you need to upload a DMP of created there automatically to a repository, for example, to Zenodo, you can, you can easily do that. And uh, as an independent researcher, you can, well, as an individual researcher, you can, you can use most of these, uh, you can use most of these tools for free. You just have to create an account. Uh, there are also uh, DMP checklists that you can use and they're very valuable. You can access them by clicking on these uh, links. So this is what the DMP template looks like. It is divided into sections uh, and there are useful questions in each section. Sections are here like grayish and um, um, every section has uh, uh, useful questions uh, that help researchers and uh, the questions actually guide them through the post process of writing a DMP. Uh, it is structured, which is really important because it can be very intimidating and off-putting for a researcher to, to, to face just a blank document and that uh, when he has to start from scratch. And um, uh, it's also problematic because uh, if, if they, they start with the blank document, they can, they can skip an, an important piece of information. So uh, as for the tools, you can use... Um, uh, DMP online. Uh, in order to use it, you have to create, uh, it is a tool that was uh, created by a digital creation, creation center. Um, you have to create an account and uh, when you do that, you'll be, you'll be able to write a plan. Uh, first, uh, you have to you, you have to ask a few questions. What research projects are, project are you uh, planning? So basically you have to give this DMP a name. Uh, if it is a mock project, there is a checkbox you can check. Uh, as um, for the primary research uh, organization, this is your, uh, your university. So if you start typing and it fails, it cannot find it, you can just tick uh, the box that says, my research organization is not listed. Uh, as for the funding organization, as you start um, typing, it will autocomplete. So, and if it doesn't, uh, if it doesn't find your funding organization, you, you can just tick uh, that you, there is no, no funder. Uh, basically, uh, what does this, this section here do? It tailors the rest of the process to, to your needs. Uh, in, in other words, you will get a template in accordance with, with the funder's requirements. Uh, the second tool you can use is Argos. There, there are more of them. You, you can find them on, on, the, um, on the list uh, on the slide before. So the second tool is Argos. It was created by OpenAir. Uh, you can find public DMPs here, which can be really useful. Uh, as um, uh, it has, uh, it has uh, templates tool. So, and you can export created DMPs in PDF, Word, JSON, or XML formats. Uh, it is free. 
for researchers uh, and uh, they can sign into their account. You can access Argos uh, even, even with your Twitter work ID or, or Google, Google account. Uh, so basically that's it about the DMPs. I just wanted to show you um, one DMP as an example. So you can see what uh, what a DMP, what a bad DMP looks like. Just a second, let me share the my screen. I have to stop sharing in order to share it. Let me find it, sorry. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Uh, so, uh, so there is a very useful, uh, you can see it here, uh, sample uh, data management plans for training purposes on Zenodo. And uh, you can always use them, analyze them, uh, and the uh, use them and analyze them um, in your trainings. Uh, I will send you the link in the chat. Uh, here it is. Mm. Uh, so uh, these, uh, these DMPs here, you have three DMPs uh, in life sciences, social sciences and humanities. Uh, they lack in detail that the post-war DMP should have. And um, it is, uh, when you read the DMP, uh, all the DMPs, you, it, is, um, it is clear that um, um, the, the creator of the DMP had the intention to share the data, to make them fair, but uh, didn't, really, didn't really manage to deliver. Um, so I, I chose the the life science DMP. I will just briefly analyze it. Uh, it is uh, I chose the life science because it's it's the closest thing to what I actually did. Uh, so this uh, DMP is about uh, uh, white tooth shrews. Uh, it is estimated, which are estimated to to affect the population of a larger breed of shrews by twenty fifty. Uh, the project, this project. Uh, uh, says it, it aims to engage citizen science. Uh, they will use uh, the data collected by the members of uh, the members of the uh, the public. So uh, you see here that uh, the DM, this DMP has uh, all the elements every DMP should uh, should have. Uh, it. Uh, yeah, it has like uh, six of these um, sections. So let's start with the uh, data collection. Here you can see, uh, so data collection is a part that uh, is supposed to uh, give us information um, it, it, about methodology uh, that will be used to collect and produce data, which uh, we don't see here. Uh, it says here that the members of the public um, will uh, collect uh, data and that their collection, uh, location names or emails will be uh, acquired, but it doesn't say in what way they make it compliant with the GDPR. Uh, we see no information of data provenance. Uh, so this part of DMP is supposed to hold information about the data types, formats, and volumes. And as you can see, there is no such information here. It says nothing about it. Uh, as for the documentation and the data quality, uh, we would ex expect here uh, to find information about how the data would be organized, information about metadata that will be provided to help uh, others find and identify the data, information about uh, data standards that, that will be used uh, we would expect to see information about uh, how the data will be organized, folder structure, how will the data sets be named, uh, will they use naming convention and which. Uh, it is said that uh, uh, in the data collection part that um, the part of the collected data will be submitted to national biodiversity base, so we would expect here to see links to that info. 
there is nothing about data quality control measures that will be used. So, uh, so this could this part could uh, could really uh, really be improved. Uh, as for the data storage and backup. Uh, during active research here, we only have information about the cloud service um, that will be used. Um, they don't say how will the data be recovered in case of an incident. There's nothing on who will actually have the access to, to all the data during pro project implementation. Uh, there is no info on data protection, especially uh, now that we know that there will be personal data collected in storage. As for the legal and uh, ethical requirements, as I said, there, there has to be a signed consent from a recorder in order to share their info. Uh, it doesn't say who is the donor, the owner of the, the, the data sets. Um, and resources and responsibilities, uh, we here have, uh, we have no info on uh, what the data steward, uh, uh, on what the data steward activities will be, who is responsible for implementing the DMP. And uh, I already said that uh, uh, DMP is a live document, which is uh, why regular updates should, should uh, be delivered. So uh, that's it for me. If uh, you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. This was really brief because we were we are a bit behind of schedule, but okay. Thank you, Rena. If there are no questions. I will uh, proceed. Uh, yes, if you have anything in your mind or, or if you remember to ask any question, you can always use Open Plato Forum and we will uh, we can discuss it uh, later. Okay, I will now share my screen. Um, again, okay. Okay, yes, um, this is, uh, now we will talk about data publishing and sharing. And uh, uh, like I said, the, the whole uh, topic of uh, research data management uh, involves many things. Uh, and uh, data sharing is, and publishing is uh, of course one of them and one of the most important uh, topics and uh, because of the whole complexity and broad of the topic, uh, maybe uh, uh, we will uh, do it now separately. So usually how this training uh, concept should look like, could look like, uh, maybe uh, it's uh, the uh, best uh, for your uh, researchers to know the whole concepts of uh, research data management, pair principles, uh, DMPs uh, first uh, to, to explain that to them first. And after that, uh, you can talk about sharing and publishing uh, because um, a lot of uh, uh, people when talk about uh, especially open data and then now it's mandated by the uh, uh, funders, they uh, tend to ask, how can I publish my data? But if that data is yeah, haven't uh, uh, passed the process of RDM and isn't uh, according to the fair principles, then uh, publishing publishing that data in open uh, access would be any much uh, a pro, uh, good. Um, and. Uh, you should always remember that your training uh, in uh, 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 in uh, R, uh, RDM is in open science they, uh, open science uh, setting. Uh, so um, uh, when you design your trainings, try to emphasize emphasize this thing on uh, on uh, sharing. So sharing is very important thing because uh, it uh, it is the whole point of open science is actually on sharing. 
uh, and uh, with uh, that in mind, uh, keep uh, be clear with open data and how can it, uh, uh, what does it mean and uh, what can and what cannot be open and what are the dangerous things of uh, opening the data and uh, why is it necessary. So uh, try to, to keep that especially in focus. Um, and also uh, important thing is to identify and uh, clearly uh, explain uh, where uh, can researchers uh, deposit and publish uh, their data, uh, their research data. So uh, the one thing uh, that uh, needs to be uh, clearly understand is that, uh, and clear, clearly articulate is that data now has more prominent role uh, than possibly before. Uh, and uh, you can, uh, because this is, uh, like I said, a complex topic, you can simplify it by uh, concentrating on these four points uh, that researchers need to, uh, to adhere uh, to ensure that good data management practices are done. Like, like we said it before, documentation, storage, backup, uh, and everything. Uh, also to deposit data in a trusted repositories with persistent identifiers and to associate data uh, with publications. That means that to connect uh, this uh, data with uh, the relevant work and uh, <clears throat> to publish uh, uh, the results in organized collections and uh, prepare that uh, uh, for later reuse. Uh, uh, your audience will now, when you uh, explain this, them, uh, these four points, they will uh, recognize all the things they were uh, listening prior to that. Uh, like you, they will recognize RDM principles here, they will rec recognize FAIR principles, uh, and also uh, one thing that is uh, 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 very important, not most important thing here is the data management plan, which will uh, uh, envelop all this thing in one thing and uh, keep it all together. Um, first, uh, also you need to clarify some, some concepts. Uh, where, what does it mean to deposit data? Uh, it actually means to upload a digital object that is uh, research data or article or any other documentation on a platform that enables uh, a good description with metadata and standardized metadata and uh, that implements long-term preservation. Um, also, uh, you have to articulate a concept of what does it mean to uh, provide access, to give access uh, to data. Uh, that means that uh, data can be opened, that it can be closed or restricted to a certain uh, group or reviewers or embargoed. It can be uh, opened, but after a certain, uh, a certain time. And also uh, uh, important is uh, when giving access is to provide a uh, uh, right license of how to use or, or use uh, that uh, and instructions of how to reuse that uh, data later on. Um, other things that have to be uh, also clarified are uh, some uh, terms that are used frequently, but that they are non-synonymous. Um, they're like a uh, term shared data. What does it mean to share data? That means like sharing, like in any other way, like, uh, like I said, uh, you can email data, data to, to somebody. That means sharing. Publishing data means to publish in a, a suitable uh, platform, in suitable format that is later on discoverable and citable. And archiving data means uh, preparing data for a long-term preservations. Uh, and what 
uh, you need to deposit what the, uh, is uh, not not just data. Uh, it is also metadata needs to be deposited as well, and also the documentation. Uh, you probably realize that I mentioned this uh, quite a few times uh, during this uh, this day, but. Uh, it is uh, important, and uh, you cannot uh, be uh, you cannot say that enough. So uh, I keep repeating that to your researchers that they need not just data but the whole package uh, of it uh, to uh, uh, to have it. And uh, of course, fair principles help help a lot. Uh, DMPs as well uh, to to. Um, uh, uh, to organize that data in a more convenient way to, to be deposited. And uh, now is the topic that always uh, comes to mind, especially when you talk about data management and uh, everything related to data. And like I said, when you combine it with open science, immediately arise a question of open data. Um, now we have uh, last few years more, we have uh, more and more funders, uh, especially international funders who are, uh, uh, who are requiring uh, that researchers deposit their data. Like we have uh, European Commission with Horizon Europe and uh, before that in, in Horizon uh, 2020, uh, we had uh, these uh, requirements uh, that uh, data should be deposited as soon as possible and to assure open access, uh, access to this the deposited data. And uh, uh, also uh, uh, there are some rules on what licenses uh, should be uh, that data uh, licensed on. Uh, and uh, Creative Commons uh, attribution license or CC BY license and also CC a public domain or CC zero license is, uh, or any other license with equivalent rights. Uh, what does it, that mean also is uh, uh, you can use CC licenses for articles for uh, data sets but uh, some uh, uh, data digital articles uh, are not uh, uh, CC licenses are not suited for that uh, uh, digital articles like uh, software. Uh, it's better to use uh, GNU or GNU licenses, Apache licenses, and there are many others. And uh, MIT also had uh, these licenses for that. And uh, I will uh, leave uh, links in open Plato for some resources that you can uh, uh, go and explore more on, on this uh, on this topic. Uh, also, uh, in Horizon Europe, uh, there is also that uh, yeah, I talk about licenses and also about metadata that needs to be deposited, uh, and of course, uh, metadata sh must be opened under. CC0 or equivalent uh, license that it means to be in public uh, domain, really available. Um, and of course, it all follows fair principles. So, you know, uh, accessible principle uh, stipulates that uh, metadata should be always accessible. Uh, other funders also here to this, uh, we have an example here with uh, Wellcome Trust. They are also required their data to be open and accessible under CC BY uh, licenses uh, whenever it is possible. Also uh, with uh, Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation, um, they also stipulate that the license, uh, that uh, sorry, research data uh, and other documentation documentation uh, have to be uh, openly available. Uh, and also there, there is, for both cases, the note that uh, if it is ethically unsound and legally, uh, there, there are legal issues here, it cannot, uh, it doesn't have to be open. Uh, it is not a uh, prerogative. 
uh, if it's not required. Uh, sorry. And uh, yes, and this is this line is uh, very uh, oftenly used. Uh, as open as possible, as closed as necessary. And this is uh, probably the line where you can start all your uh, uh, all your uh, trainings about uh, open data, particularly, but uh, uh, and even uh, data sharing as well. Uh, that means that uh, data that uh, are uh, uh, contain sensitive information uh, or are in some other uh, have some other ethical or legal issues uh, should not be uh, it is um, advisable to and uh, justifiable to to uh, keep it uh, closed as long as it is uh, of course necessary uh, of course uh, all the uh, open data can uh, uh, yes, uh, just one, uh, just one to, thing to say. Um, all the data uh, can uh, be uh, closed for a certain amount of time, like I said, for embargoed, uh, for a certain amount of time to for researchers to to explore their works, uh, uh, explore that data to create works, and later on can be published openly if it's if is required. And but uh, what is important, it must be uh, it must be said in uh, a data management plan, especially uh, the founders like Horizon Europe uh, are looking for that to to say that in a data management plan. So if researchers I say don't uh, are not required by their founders of the institution to open their data or they or any other reasons I don't want to open their data. Uh, just to make sure that uh, their data uh, relies with these uh, standards and principles that it, it is well managed uh, and well preserved and uh, that it here adheres to fair data principles. Uh, also, there are different levels of data. Uh, if you have, when uh, some research is done, you have a lot of raw data that is the the the, the whole uh, quantity of the bulk of, of all the data gathered uh, and uh, that data is later on processed through all the analytics and software processes and uh, it is uh, chunked uh, from that raw data and after that it can be shared with others uh, and uh, later on it can be uh, some of that parts it can be open uh, like I said, the no uh, raw data is a huge volume of data. It cannot be uh, opened and, and uh, uh, published all. It's if it's uh, not possible from infrastructure level. But uh, also there are some legal and ethical concerns because raw data can uh, contain, like I said, sensitive information, like personal information, especially if it's done with uh, human subjects, like patients in the hospitals. And uh, also sensitive information can be um, like uh, geographical locations of ind endangered species or uh, some sensitive ecosystems that can also be sensitive and should be kept uh, secretly. So raw data contains all of that. Process data, uh, that is the other thing. When it, uh, data is processed, it, it is usually anonymized just uh, to, to, to hide these sensitive information. So you have to uh, articulate to, your, to, to uh, your researchers to keep that in mind, what they are publishing and how it can be do it. Um, so yeah, now, uh, publishing and sharing uh, when it's that in mind, we have uh, uh, this usual uh, when this, where, where we uh, ventures where we uh, we can publish uh, the data. Uh, uh, this is this these are four usuals uh, and I will um, explain explain uh, more in details, but uh, here I uh, 
I um, ordered it in uh, in a way that uh, this is uh, more something that is more advisable and uh, uh, from a less advisable to more advisable ways of of, uh, of publishing data. Uh, so first, the most uh, now. Uh, it's not most, yeah, it's most uh, usual way or most common way and uh, something that most researchers are uh, used to uh, is uh, now is to publish uh, their data sets in journals as a supplementary data. Uh, like we said earlier, uh, it is not always advisable uh, to publish that as supplementary, not because the formats uh, are not very good, but more and more uh, uh, publishers now have uh, some uh, other platforms or uh, infrastructure that can be uh, for that data sets to be better uh, published and uh, deposited. So uh, what are good things about this? There is uh, a publisher requirements. I don't know if it is good, but uh, maybe it is because uh, sometimes publishers require that data uh, should be open and should be available. Uh, uh, the next thing is, yeah, uh, data is available from articles. So uh, if uh, somebody is reading uh, uh, your article, it, uh, they, um, it, it can be really uh, reachable, I say. And also there are, uh, uh, good uh, things like data papers, which I will explain uh, later. Uh, what are uh, what is what are cons with with this? What is what are difficulties? Uh, data rights. It can be risky. Who owns the data rights for these uh, data sets? It it have to be uh, it have to be a deal uh, very early on, and uh, maybe it uh, collides with your institutional's, uh, uh, institutional's contracts or, or contracts that you have with the funder. Your researchers should look that uh, upon. Uh, it can imply costs. It can be, uh, data can be closed uh, because of the, the general policy. And also there is a question of long-term preservation. What will happen if, for say, uh, some, uh, some publisher ran out of business? So uh, maybe that is some things to, to keep in mind. <clears throat> uh, what are the ways how to publish data in, uh, in journals? You can send data set to the publisher and it will be published online. Uh, also, publishers can ask uh, and uh, provide some uh, repository list uh, to, to, uh, for authors to, to uh, publish their data there and provide the link. And also, authors can give contact information that is especially for the, some maybe sensitive data or, or other, it can be only requested upon contact. Uh, there are also uh, data papers journals, uh, journals that are particularly dealing with uh, with data. Uh, that is a good way to disseminate uh, for researchers to disseminate their findings. Uh, some of them uh, are um, uh, data by MDPI, uh, data in brief by Elsevier, or scientific data by Springer uh, Springer Nature. Uh, there are a lot of others. I will uh, try. Uh, yeah, I will. I will provide a link for some uh, uh, journals uh, a list that you can uh, uh, promote to your to your researchers. It is a good way to uh, uh, to tell your uh, for researchers to publish because data papers provide. Uh, much more needed information or how the data uh, uh, to explain the data and how the data was collected and generated and and, uh, and uh, analyzed and everything it can be uh, very much in, in more details and I think uh, most of these uh, data uh, data papers are in open access which is uh, also a good thing <clears throat> uh, sorry um the other thing uh, that can be also used is if you have institutional uh, data repository. 
uh, what is uh, good with this is that provides long-term preservation and access. It is also uh, in-house solution. So, we, uh, so you are, uh, you can be safe with that, that no, uh, um, what will be, what will happen with your data. Uh, of course, uh, this data repository is accept to various, da various data types. And what is uh, most uh, important, it provides no costs. Uh, uh, on the other side, uh, it uh, may have difficulties with disciplinary metadata. Metadata uh, are usually usually uh, more generic ones. So uh, providing some additional uh, metadata can be a problem, but it can be solved with some additional documentation, but uh, not in a, maybe not in a, uh, in a format that is more suitable. Uh, and also, uh, these repositories can be less visible uh, than thematic repositories, but um, that is cannot is not always the case. But it, it should be uh, kept in mind. And if your institution have a data repository, uh, always promote it uh, as much as you can. Demonstrate how you work with it, how is uh, deposit, and demo demonstrate all the positive aspects. We have uh, here on this uh, bootcamp. We have on, on the day one. Uh, uh, it was discussed all, of all the positive aspects of institutional repositories. Uh, yeah, and also if you don't have institutional repository, uh, data repository, maybe you can use your institutional repository, but make sure it uh, it is aligned with all the necessary uh, standards for, uh, for um, machine readability and for uh, communication uh, um, uh, protocols and, and, and all. Uh, yes, when demonstrating your institutional repository, always point out this good things like uh, if you if you provide PID like DOI it's good thing you have user statistic it's great it's great to have version control uh, that is all, all, all very much included in most of data repositories also licenses uh, different types of uh, files and how many files can be there metadata terms of use uh, and so on um, Next thing are uh, these general purpose repositories. Um, what is good with them is they usually provide uh, much better visibility because uh, of the wider audience uh, who are uh, using it uh, for finding uh, data sets or for uh, for depositing their own data sets, so uh, it's it can be a common place for for um, for most of the researchers. Uh, good thing is also they accept uh, various data types because uh, they are aware that they are uh, uh, they are a, platform, a good platform for interdisciplinary uh, sciences. So uh, they are usually uh, make sure to, to suit their um, datas, uh, for that uh, data uh, formats for that need. And also uh, some platform, platforms like Zenodo or Figshare also provide, uh, uh, also provide uh, uh, examples and uh, provide uh, uh, up to, uh, to, to deposit uh, solutions to deposit uh, other things, uh, not just uh, uh, data set, uh, not just data, but also software code and uh, uh, other documentation uh, and also articles. And also uh, uh, they can be connected with other services, for, for example, with GitHub. Uh, what is not very good with that, they usually only provide like simple or uh, general metadata set, uh, metadata standards like um, uh, usually it is data site or uh, Dublin core. Uh, it can be difficult for some um, 
uh, disciplines that uh, uh, that need and, and they, that generate uh, much more metadata than uh, they can use uh, that that can be provided here. And also, uh, uh, I said did I write it here? No quality control over the positive data. That is true for Zenodo, for uh, Figshare. Uh, nobody controls what you deposit and uh, how the, uh, uh, what is the quality of metadata. Nobody uh, controls that. Uh, and uh, also with OSF, but uh, on Dryad, uh, it is uh, controlled. Uh, there is uh, There are uh, uh, <clears throat> personnel who is uh, more uh, acquainted with this and they, your uh, researchers usually communicate or, or data stewards usually communicate with them and to provide, to provide uh, uh, more quality metadata and data. Uh, but also Dryad uh, uh, costs, uh, I think, but maybe, I don't know if some arrangements can be made for institutions to, to provide some kind of uh, uh, arrangements, but it, it, it costs. Uh, when you articulate, yeah, if you don't have your institutional repository, uh, general purpose repositories like Zenodo or Figshare can be, or, or, or OSF, can be a great example to provide infrastructure and to provide, provide services for data management to your researchers. And you can demonstrate that uh, and you can uh, show all the advantages that uh, these uh, pro repositories provide, like uh, DOIs they, they are, or uh, persistent identifiers, uh, findability, uh, citations. Uh, they can, you can also uh, they can also track uh, their uh, usage statistics. How many uh, times uh, these um, these were uh, their dat data sets were download, and uh, also to support uh, different data types. Uh, maybe somebody something that they should need, and also. Um, uh, yeah, that they provide uh, different types of licenses, which is very important because of the maybe if they have some software code, uh, they can use Apache, uh, MIT, GNU, or other licenses. And uh, one of the most uh, interesting uh, things uh, to consider is uh, their uh, that uh, they can make or uh, join existing ones uh, research uh, communities. Uh, and there, where they can share the data, and that way their data can be uh, uh, visible uh, even more. Uh, if you don't have uh, a good quality data, institutional data repository that can provide versions, uh, PIDs, uh, and so on, but if you have some kind of uh, rudimentary maybe structure, you can use, you can uh, advise your uh, your uh, researchers to deposit in uh, in general purpose repositories, and you can, but you can uh, uh, extract and deposit just metadata in your own repository, just uh, as a way to, for uh, tracking your research uh, outputs, and uh, and it's easier for them to do that. And also, uh, some uh, you have some uh, national policies that require uh, your, uh, researchers uh, to, uh, to do that. That you also you you should also keep in mind that. <clears throat> uh, and the the four of these <clears throat> uh, uh, ventures I would like to present here is, uh, and you can present it to your. Researchers as well is uh, are uh, disciplinary repositories or thematic repositories. Um, they offer uh, usually they offer uh, data management services uh, on spot, and uh, it is good because uh, they uh, rely mostly on good quality data and metadata. So they uh, are careful for what are they uh, um, taking in their repositories or, and they usually talk with uh, 
with the depositors, uh, they have that kind of communication with them. Um, they, yeah, they, they, uh, they are, you are very likely to accept complete, complete data sets because um, they are interesting in one particular discipline and uh, data sets can be, uh, complete data sets uh, uh, tell much more than uh, some uh, parts that are just meant for some uh, research article, maybe complete data sets provide much more needed information. Uh, also, uh, there is great visibility uh, when depositing to, to this, <clears throat> sorry, when depositing to this uh, 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 repositories because uh, uh, th this is uh, the place where uh, most of the, if not all the researchers from the certain scientific domain get and uh, they uh, are looking for, for that particular place to look uh, for their uh, data. Um, uh, yes, and, uh, and usually these kind of repositories provide very, very rich metadata and uh, they are here to uh, specific uh, disciplinary metadata standards. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Uh, what are not good things with this is that may include costs, but if you if uh, researchers are funded, uh, they can uh, try to reimburse these this, uh, costs, uh, or, but it, they, they should mention this in data management plan. That is why I again uh, uh, um, go back. That is why data management plans are so important in the whole process. And uh, they can, uh, like I said, they can require high standards in metadata quality. And that is also why you need to uh, focus uh, your lectures that why is data management uh, training important? Because at the end of the whole process, if they want to deposit something in a disciplinary repository, they will ask uh, for them to, for the whole uh, set of other things and uh, uh, they should uh, be done previously. And uh, uh, yes, uh, when uh, I, I gave him here uh, one example of uh, one of the, the repositories, this is for high energy physics. Uh, uh, they usually uh, deposit here data uh, from the, especially from the large experiments and uh, very costly experiments that were done in, in uh, CERN. Uh, uh, they cost a lot of money and there are huge, huge quantities of uh, data. And uh, there is a special repositories they made uh, for that data uh, to, uh, to be deposited there. And researchers can use that data. At, um, yeah, we think most of, of that data is in open access. And you, you should point to the uh, those community services and, uh, and domains where they can find their repositories. Uh, in previous slide, I uh, <clears throat> provided uh, this. Uh, you can you you can, you you can look uh, and uh, acknowledge them to use <clears throat> retreedata.org registry of research data repositories as a good service. Uh, to uh, show to and to to um, how to uh, find the right repository for their needs, and uh, there they will find the whole the whole uh, every information they need to know if that repository provides open access. Does it? Uh, the, is it certified? Uh, what licenses does it use? Uh, and uh, and um, uh, what metadata does it use, and so on. So it is very, very informative uh, resource uh, to, to know. So, uh, and uh, I will, this is uh, at the very much end, and I will just provide some quick summary of the whole process that we uh, uh, provided, uh, that we uh, learned today. And uh, you can see uh, this uh, graph again, uh, but now I added this DMP, 
because as a very important and integral process uh, of it, uh, of the whole thing of managing data. And uh, uh, like I said, uh, try to, to uh, keep your researchers motivated by uh, not doing this whole at once, try to uh, separate it in a smaller uh, pieces uh, because of the, like I said, uh, because of the whole complexity of the subject, try to, uh, to break it down in smaller pieces and, and uh, especially try to, um, uh, to uh, integrate more with the researchers. And uh, when you start doing these trainings, you will uh, see uh, what are their real problems and uh, you can uh, uh, you can uh, hear from that and uh, later on to, to find some uh, solutions to their problems and how you can uh, provide uh, better trainings uh, for them. Um, okay, thank you. If there are some questions, please uh, ask now or, or uh, I couldn't follow the chat, uh, sorry, but... Uh, uh, Ask now or, oh, okay, do you have some tools to recommend to 